My name is Alana Linderoth. I am a program officer at Manga Bay, which is an international environmental journalism nonprofit. Uh, we report on um, environmental science, conservation, a lot on indigenous people, local communities, um, tropical forests. We mostly uh, focus on places um, in having acute um, environmental impacts and that have the, mo the most ecologically rich um, regions. So um, we don't do a lot of US-based reporting, actually. A lot of our reporting is in Southeast Asia, um, South America, and um, we, re we do original reporting in multiple languages. And um, yeah, again, you can find us. It's Manga Bay. Um, I think that's all I'll say about myself. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, even more so, I'm excited to welcome this panel. Um, where I'm going to give you a little background and then they'll each have an opportunity to share a little bit about what brings them to this particular panel and then we'll, we'll d dig right into the, the conversation. Okay. So um, to my left here is Aner Benami. He is the co-founder and managing director of Candide Group, where he works with clients to deploy capital in support of more sustainable and just in support of a more sustainable and just economy. At Candide Group, Anera co-leads the Afterglow Climate Justice Fund, providing catalytic debt, debt capital to bring climate solutions to disinvested communities across the U.S. Um, I'm gonna let's see. Yeah, Punjani. Okay. It's not in the list here. They're not sitting in order, so that's okay. <laughs> um, I, next, I have Punjani Singha. Uh, he, he is the co founder of Amazonian Impact Ventures in 2020. Oh, he co founded, excuse me, Amazonian Impact Ventures in 2020 and is passionate about addressing the climate emergency challenge via investing in social entrepreneurial businesses in the Amazon. Amazonian Impact Ventures has been set, set up with the aim of providing access to capital via impact-linked li finance to indigenous communities and smallholder farmers together with technical assistance in order to improve the supply chain and forest protection in the Amazon. Next, we have Suzanne Singer. Suzanne Singer, she co-founded Native Renewables with a vision to provide energy access for tens of thousands of Hopi and Navajo families who live without electricity. Her engineering background provides the technical, found, technical foundation to develop programs that promote tribal energy independence, offer affordable off-grid solar energy solutions, and build a solar workforce. Um, yeah, and she's going to fill in some more background as well. Um, next, I have, uh, I'd like to welcome Emil Sirin Gualinga. Emil is a sustainable finance consultant and member of the Quechua people of the Serra Yuca in Ecuador. Emil has worked with financial institutions such as asset managers and venture capitalists, standard setters, NGOs, and indigenous people in various projects promoting sustainable investments. Emil was co was also the co sorry the lead author of the Respecting Indigenous Rights an Actionable Due Diligence Toolkit Toolkit for in Institutional Investors which guides pension funds and asset managers on indigenous rights. Finally, I would like to introduce Brett Isaac. Um, Brett Isaac was born on Denai lands growing up near Kayenta within the Navajo Nation in an area called Baby Rocks. He is of the Towering House clan, born of the Salt clan, and, enro and an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation. Brett Isaac's leadership at Navajo Power transcends mere business strategy, making him a true champion of indigenous communities. He plays a pivotal role in creating pathways for these communities to unlock the potential of their natural resources thrive through clean energy development and achieve energy independence, building off his decade of experience in creating solar and battery storage for underserved homes in the Navajo Nation. 
Brett is working to scale solar opportunities and create meaningful equity for indigenous communities. So um, it's, yeah, my honor to be here with these movers and shakers um, in this sector. Uh, next, I'm gonna let the panelists um, just, again, share a little bit more about who they are and what brings them to this particular um, session, and then we'll dig into some the discussion. Thank you. Okay. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, Anir Benami, uh, again with the Candide Group. Uh, we're an investment advisory uh, based just across the, the Bay Bridge here in Oakland. Uh, we're celebrating our 10th year anniversary very soon um, and uh, have uh, over the years worked with uh, clients to deploy capital in support of um, disinvested marginalized communities. Um, within that have been committed to sort of pushing the envelope on what it means to do this work and into sort of more innovative uh, models, more community-centered models, um, have related to this topic um, a couple of um, projects, a couple of uh, companies that we've supported through this advisory business include working with uh, Brett and uh, and, and Navajo power and using some, 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 we'll talk a little bit more about kind of the, the, some of the innovative thinking and structuring that went into that and uh, working with uh, Native American Natural Foods, which is a, a business that uh, aims to um, kind of revitalize the, uh, um, um, bring back bison herds to, uh, to Native com communities. Um, um, Outside of the, the advisory business, um, uh, as Alana pointed out, we have uh, we are now launching a climate justice fund, um, which will be focused specifically on deploying uh, capital uh, or deploying climate solutions in the U.S. Uh, in disinvested communities and marginalized communities. Again, requiring really kind of catalytic capital, really filling looking to sort of fill the gaps required to make these projects happen, and there are many gaps <laughs> um, um, to, to make those projects happen. This is our second um, debt fund, debt vehicle. Our first debt vehicle uh, that we launched a few years ago is the Olamina Fund, led by uh, the, the, the amazing Leslie Lindo, uh, sitting over there. Uh, and the Olamina Fund has already uh, deployed $40 million um, with a focus on black and indigenous communities um, working through three intermediaries and supporting um, community-centered uh, projects, real estate and land projects. Um, I should point out too, and we'll, talk, we'll touch on this uh, later on, I'm sure, uh, throughout the work we are, uh, there's, a, there's sort of this deep commitment to making sure that we are shifting not just where the capital is flowing, but sort of how it's flowing and how decisions are being made and making sure that it's not just us kind of sitting here and, and, and making picking the projects uh, that get funded and how they get funded, but really including uh, communities in sort of a deep way in that process. So. Hi, um, so I'm Pajani. Um, so I'm based out in London. So I co-founded Amazon Impact Ventures uh, about three and a half years ago. And what we wanted to target was, you know, addressing the bottleneck, which is access to funding for marginalized communities. Um, and, you know, we invest currently with multiple communities in Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia, uh, mainly in the buyer economy, because um, we believe that a standing forest is worth more than a cut down forest. So, so, so far, we've been investing in multiple uh, products like Brazil nuts, acai, macambo, aguaje, ungurawi, macambo, uh, you know, loads of more. Guayusa is one of more. And um, the idea is, you know, providing livelihood to, you know, the indigenous communities is the first port of call if you want to address climate change in the long run. And um, I think we've proven that running a social enterprise actually can make money and the community and also work for you know, investors as well. And our aim now is to kind of scale it up and invest in multiple communities in, in these parts of the rainforest. Um, I'll just pass on. 
Hello, uh, yeah, uh, Suzanne Singer here in this year, Captain of Saturday in this year, Nakarin and Abashis Chin, Bipatori Dashiche, Doashi and Nashanala. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Suzanne Singer. I'm the executive director and one of the co founders of Native Renewables. And we are a 501c3 organization um, that's based in northern Arizona. Uh, but we started our organization, it was founded by two indigenous women in 2016 because we were really frustrated that tens of thousands of our families and our communities still have no access to grid tied electricity. And so since then, we've been developing our programs, a lot of which include we are installing off-grid solar units um, for families that can power refrigerators, lights, cell phones, charging um, electronics devices. But also, we felt really strongly about building our own technical capacity within our own communities locally. And so that meant we were, had to build a workforce program. So I can look forward to talking more about that. Um, but our mission is to bring indigenous-led affordable solar power solutions and knowledge to Diné or Navajo and Hopi communities. Hi everyone, um, I'm Emil Sirengolinga from Ecuador, from the Kicho people of Sarayaku. And I work with a business and human rights resource center focused on promoting uh, indigenous community owned or community led uh, renewable energy projects. And I also work with Pajani with Amazon Impact Ventures. Um, but what brings me here to this panel is to zoom out a bit and give a macro perspective on why it's important to invest and support indigenous peoples. And I think the answer is very simple um, because indigenous peoples across the world protect the last uh, remaining nature uh, in this planet and if it wasn't for indigenous peoples then most of that wouldn't be there. Um, so indigenous peoples are, uh, comprise 6% of the world's population but protect over 8% of the world's most biodiverse areas. Um, unfortunately when we defend our territories and our rights um, we face attacks, criminalization and even uh, assassinations. So over the last uh, decade over 2,000 environmental defenders have been killed, 40% uh, of which were indigenous. And this is also happening in, uh, in, the, in climate change solutions such as renewable energy. And um, in some countries there have been uh, renewable energy projects that have displaced many indigenous peoples. And I want to illustrate uh, with a personal story of my community, what does it look like to grow up in, in such a community that's um, protecting the rights and defending our, our lives. Um, so in my community, uh, Sarayako, we have kicked out six oil companies from the territory. So until today, it's free of destruction and free of deforestation. Um, and we didn't have, the people in our community didn't have any education or any resources. So imagine what we could have done if we had all those resources and if we were part of the, the decision making. And unfortunately, that's not happening. Um, and the companies, I mean, the, you don't often hear about those details in, in the media, but the strategies that the uh, companies and governments have used against us, um, they hire teams of anthropologists and sociologists to find ways to divide the communities, to divide us. And then they invited, in, um, invaded our territories with the public forces, with military. Um, and fortunately, we were able to kick them out. Um, and 10 years later, we were able to win a victory in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, uh, which has set a precedent for other com communities um, to be able to defend uh, their rights as well. Um, so, yes, so I think that goes to show why it's so important that to support community-led projects and not externally imposed, uh, self-determined projects, make sure that indigenous peoples are part of decision-making, and each, com each indigenous community or people are distinct. So we as indigenous peoples, when we meet other indigenous peoples, the first thing is to learn um, about them. We cannot go with the presumptions of how to work. So I think that's um, my main message is to support the self-determination of indigenous peoples because otherwise we won't have, um, otherwise all of those uh, climate change initiatives and nature protection, etc. it's simply not going to work. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I've been in, um, trying to wake you all up. Um, 
My name is Brett Isaac. I am the founder and executive chairman of Navajo Power. Um, really what brings me to this space is, you know, Navajo Power is a clean energy developer. We're a public benefit corporation, and we're really trying to catalyze some of the biggest projects, clean energy projects in the country, sited on tribal lands, and working to maximize benefits for indigenous communities. Our purpose is really to add indigenous voices into that conversation around transition. Historically, our communities have been impacted by energy industry, coal, oil, gas, uranium, all those different entities came through our communities and left kind of a path of destruction in its past, as well as trauma. In order for that to not be the same with renewables and to not be the same with economics, we felt that it was important for us to own that direction going forward, creating a company that essentially sets the table. The other thing is also being able to create the platform for the injection point of capital to do good within these communities. We want to be able to develop these projects in a way that looks at sustainability around their impact, as well as building community benefit structures that actually are tuned to the community's needs. It's a holistic way of thinking around energy in terms of how it interfaces with these communities, what it gives and what it takes back. The other thing is we also wanna look at how our communities interface in a global setting when it comes to participating in these regional markets. We build competitive projects that have to compete with everything in, in, in a national grid system. So looking at solar and storage as a way to you know, essentially um, create that economic engine and driver for these communities to thrive. The idea behind Navajo Power's formation was really born out of these transition conversations the decline of revenues, the decline of jobs due to the exit of fossil fuel from our communities left the void. And, is, and we wanted to be able to fill that void with a much more optimistic viewpoint of what energy can do. Um, myself coming up in, you know, growing up in a coal community, I always, you know, envisioned our, our ability to change our direction by participating in these systems influencing how finance interfaces with our communities, interfacing how we take things like energy and put them to our advantage. And so my journey into this and being you know, an honor to sit amongst you know, these uh, people is really about networking, finding funding and resources so that we can catalyze this transition. Federal you know, initiatives like the Inflation Reduction Act are great on paper. But how do we get from where our communities are to where they have to be to be able to catalyze that impact? How are we gonna take those billions of dollars committed from the federal government and land them in communities that historically have had limited access to funds like that? That requires organizations like ours and, and the folks here taking you know, this mission aligned capital and putting it in the hands of people that can actually make meaningful change. And so. I'm very honored to be here and, and thank you for uh, uh, sitting with us today. Thanks everyone, yes. Um, yeah, it's, I am, this panel is really diverse in that we have a business, we have nonprofit, we have investors and, um, and, and people um, strategizing and consulting on investments. So um, yeah, I think this is gonna be a really good discussion. To kick us off, um, I want to just ask the question of what do investors need to consider when investing in indigenous people, local communities to tackle climate change? Um, and kind of a sub-question of that is how does the conventional impact invest, how does conventional impact investing um, not apply to when investing in indigenous people, local communities? Yeah, and people can just jump in. I, I was going to say, I mean, based on experience in working with Candide and Anir and, and Morgan and the team over there, you know, our experience is that innovation is just the, the, the starting point. You know, investing in these communities requires some 
degree of understanding and meeting the communities and organizations like us where we are. You know, our communities don't have historic relationships with finance. Commercial banking didn't reach our community, so financial tools are very limited. Those of us that were privileged enough to go and, and experience that in the world and have access to capital are trying to translate that back to how it benefits the communities. You know, we went to institutions to try to see how we could get benefit from that. But the first thing that really um, was kind of a, a point of emphasis is understanding the framework that's going to, that the infrastructure that's got to be created to create that investable injection point. Where does that capital go in to work on behalf of the impact, but also, you know, work within the rules of all the regulatory systems so that it, you know, it, it does everything it needs to do to be effective. Um, and, and one other thing lastly I'll say is like, there also is a bit of patience that indigenous communities need in order to like see these things through. You know, as we are learning, as we are deploying, you know, we're kind of creating new markets and new opportunities at the, with the same stroke. So working with a lot of foundations has been about providing a lot of conversations around ed the education around what it is we're doing, how we hope to do it, and how that intersects with the initiatives that foundations are putting forward as impacts. I'll, ju I'll just jump in because it's sort of related to that same sort of thread of work, right? So I mean, sort of thinking about three things, um, ownership, trust, and capacity. Uh, so on the ownership side, um, you know, a project like, um, or a portfolio of projects like, um, like those that Navajo Power is developing, once they're up and running, they're really lucrative, right? They, big projects that generate a lot of, uh, economic benefit. Um, the question is who that economic benefit goes to, right? If, if, if all it does is, well, these are great projects that are putting clean electrons on the grid, but ultimately they're owned by whatever Goldman Sachs or not, you know, not to pick on Goldman Sachs, but fill in the name, fill in the blank uh, investor and all of the benefit flows to that investor, that's, that's a problem, right? And so part of the, the gap was making sure that there is early, the early capital that comes in was structured as debt, right? And so, and not equity. So they don't have to sell ownership of the project so equity so early in the process and they get to retain uh, ownership. And the second piece around trust, uh, again, one example, as Brett obviously mentioned, the, um, these communities are not exactly, they have no reason to <laughs> necessarily have, uh, they have a lot of reasons not to trust uh, outside investors and sources of capital coming into these communities or developers coming into these communities. And, um, you know, this needs to kind of move at the pace of, of, of trust. And one cool example in this, with this investment was that uh, instead of, if, if you've ever negotiated an investment with opposing legal counsel on each side, you know that pretty quickly the sort of trust kind of can go out the door and the legal counsel, they're trained to just think like worst case scenario, how the other side could like screw you over and what, all, what are all the ways to sort of protect you, right? Uh, the way this process was actually uh, conducted is there was one legal counsel for both sides, right? So we, did, we actually shared legal counsel and kind of taking instead of sort of opposing sides of the table, we were like this is one problem. We're all kind of looking at it. We're both sort of on the same side of the table. Uh, and then the third, uh, capacity, uh, right? So yeah, you know, um, there is often a, um, uh, to the point about billions of dollars that could start flowing into these uh, communities, we need to build the, the, the capacity, the organizations that kind of know how to, um, how to, how to uh, even ask for that money, how to, how to structure, uh, set up structures for that money, right? And, and so there is a, an element of some capacity building and, 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 and philanthropic support that is, is critical there. Maybe, maybe I'll share in our experience what we've faced so far. Um, when you invest in, you know, IPLCs, indigenous people in local communities, it takes a longer time to kind of get to know the community, higher transaction costs, lower ticket size. So we, we've found that, you know, you need to go beyond the normal traditional lending methods. So blended finance is, is kind of really much needed. So if there's any, you know, investor in the room, um, you know, 
it is quite important to have long-term patient capital when you're starting to develop capacity because if you look at any industry that's been developed, let's take you know, EVs, it's been heavily subsidized by governments and by you know, local, uh, local councils. But when it comes to indigenous people on their land, there's no kind of that sort of subsidy available or cheap debt available. So concessionary and blended finance is so important at this stage to build capacity. And then, you know, it's a very, very lucrative uh, business that the community and investors can, can benefit from in the long term. But they have to allow, the, you know, the entrepreneurs and the, the communities to build their, their, their capacity. And I think that's a crucial part, in my opinion. Yeah, I think the ensuring there is an indigenous-led component to the work is really critical. Um, I think that helps, goes a long way with the trust piece of things, but also understanding the, a lot of the community members know what is best for their community. So coming in and saying, this is what you should do is not really the best way to approach people. Um, easy way to turn people off. Uh, and I think for our work specifically, thinking about talking about the technical workforce piece and having our own experts in the community, I think can translate also to the financial piece and how does knowledge about, like kind of what I was talking about, knowledge around financing, lending, the, the, techno, what do you say, the technical terms, like just to give you a corollary, how do we, in Navajo language, how do you explain what an inverter is? So there's a whole conversation discussion we're having on how do different people explain that. And I can imagine the same is true when you're talking about, I want to give grandma a loan. She doesn't speak English. These concepts are new to her. How do you make sure she fully understands that and you're not taking advantage of the community members that just don't have that base knowledge is really important. Um, and then I think some of the the t things that make it really challenging for us is recognizing the affordability piece of if you want if we wanted to do financing lending sometimes it's not there for all community members um, but have definitely been taken advantage of and their resources have been extracted and yet nothing went back into these families homes so then that goes for me into like an equity lens is it fair what do you charge families who have had so much taken from them and don't have electricity? So there's like lots of different, I think, dynamics that are pieces of at least our work, I, I assume also everyone else's work as well, that come into this conversation, even though you're just trying to get to one particular end goal. Um, and I think for us, a lot of the times, our model is we donate systems to families, we subsidize that cost. And I don't know if that's, um, that, it, that's sustainable long term, but for now, I think it's an interesting um, way that we're approaching things in addition to all these different pieces and how we all have different approaches. Um, so my perspective from the Amazon, it's very similar to Susan's. Um, sometimes, well, in the Amazon, we don't really have much access to um, commercial capital or, or so on, but there are a lot of uh, organizations and grants, et cetera, that um, come to work with indigenous communities, and in some cases, um, there is a presumption of what's, what will work best for the community, but unless you have grown up in that community, it's very difficult to, um, to, to know what's best for that community. So, and, and even for, for me as an individual grown up there, I'm still learning about it. So for an outsider to come and know what's best, it's, yeah, it's, um, it's not gonna be the optimal um, outcome. So I think um, go, uh, being humble and uh, learning and listening, I think that's uh, the first um, starting point. Great, thanks. Um, this leads me to my next question, what, which is, what are the biggest barriers that indigenous people, local communities face when trying to access capital? I think uh, globally, it's not just indigenous people, marginalized communities have difficulty accessing capital even in, in a developed country like this because of the lack of collateral. So, in, you know, investors need to change their mindset about that and say, you know, not everyone has got a house or a car to pledge against for a loan. So there's different ways of doing it. And I think for us, that's the biggest issue they've been facing. I think just to add on to a little bit 
the conversation earlier, um, historically in talking to investment, a lot of thinking about the tax investment, um, a lot of people will say, well, your projects aren't big enough. We don't really, your portfolio is too small, so they don't even bother talking to us. And I think that's starting to change. And I think as, again, I'm new to this, this financial world, so I may not use all the right terminology, but also that's part of the barrier is learning as an organization what we want to do and be able to trust people we're learning from um, is definitely that trust piece is everywhere in these conversations. Um, and I think some of the challenging things I've heard from other communities is, it's been mentioned already, but lack of expertise in moving forward, building these products. And if you don't have the expertise and you don't have the capital to hire the people, contract the people that can build these things that you need to move the money forward, it becomes extremely challenging. And a lot of communities, Hopi, for example, is really frustrated not being able to have the resources to bring on the right people to write grants or put financial portfolios together or bring, even bring ideas to them, explain what the different concepts are. Um, so that's, I would say, for me, I would say the top two is just the capacity and the trust. Um, there's a statistic that indigenous peoples receive less than 1% of climate financing. And that's supposed to increase now um, because of recent agreements such as the Global Biodiversity Framework. Um, but the issue that we see in the Amazon is that, as uh, Suzanne said, um, because we historically haven't been exposed to those uh, types of markets or organizations, we don't necessarily have the expertise or know-how or the networks to be able to access those. Um, and also, um, when, when this financing is increasing, um, usually what, what's happening in the Amazon is that those funds are managed by intermediaries uh, rather than by us. So I think the challenge for us is to be able to um, have those networks, build that expertise within the communities, um, and yeah, to be able to uh, receive and manage those resources and, and um, yeah, find our ways to solving climate change solutions or to, to tackle climate change um, in accordance with our own worldviews, which we know have been working for uh, hundreds or thousands of years. I think one of the biggest barriers is like, to me there's two things, one's perception. It's perceived that these communities are not in like a ready position or there's a lot of difficulty in deploying the impact in, in some way. One of the reasons commercial capital isn't available is our policy systems in indigenous communities can be hard to understand because it isn't, it wasn't never, it wasn't ever built for a purpose. <laughs> To, to, to use, it was built to control you know, like communities and, and to kind of, there was almost like an imperialism, almost, there was an imperialism that was placed over a lot of our communities that foundationally really limited our access to a lot of resources. The other thing is I think there's also a bit of like self-confidence within our communities and organizations that we don't try because we just don't think it's there. We, we perceive ourselves to be limited because one, we never had access to it, and we think it's for another crowd. But the other is, you know, I, I think a lot of institutions have yet to kind of bridge that gap. Like I said, the funding always seems like it's just on the other side of the glass. We can see it. But, you know, having friendly capital is really about coming inside with us, you know, coming, kind of, kind of meeting us across that bridge. When I look at like how, you know, even federal funding reaches these communities, there's always some caveat that we can't overcome. There's always something they put in there like a poison pill that makes it historically hard, um, you know, and, and really it's, it's the limitations of understanding what's needed to be able to deploy capital. Like what, what is, you know, and, and I think about this when it comes to like energy development, you know, we have like the Department of Energy has a loan program office that existed for like 14 years now and has zero loans deployed, you know, and through the Inflation Reduction Act, it went from $2 billion to $20 billion, but they still, you know, they're, they're, they're wanting to deploy capital, but what's the limiting factor? Even in the federal nexus of things, their trust responsibility back to communities in the U.S., they haven't quite figured out how to do that. And I feel that's a place that, you know, foundations and philanthropic capital can help build that bridge. 
because that's where we need those to take that risk and to take on that challenge because I believe if we unlock that and we inform what that is, that'll make that barrier non-existent. Yeah, I was going to lift up the if you kind of potential of um, sort of allyship or partnerships. Um, I'm thinking of an example of a, a model or a project, actually not in an indigenous community, but um, maybe relevant. It's a um, solar project in, um, uh, in, in Brooklyn um, that was uh, being developed by a local environmental justice group um, led by a Latina woman. And uh, you know this this group has real uh, you know, real credibility real relationships and community they are able to attract members of the community to the project they are able to identify the best locate and secure the best locations for community solar projects um, and they had been sort of trying to push this project forward for 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 years really um, but it is their first go at this, right? They, they haven't developed a, 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 a clean energy project previously, and they also kind of don't speak finance, right? It's hard for them. There's a, there's a bridge, there's a divide there or that's hard to bridge, right? And so they ultimately partnered with uh, and created a joint venture with a uh, clean energy developer, and uh, that project is sort of now moving forward with joint ownership, right? There is a, a group that has done this, in various communities, um, and they're they're able to sort of pull the capital into the project, um, and then and then this this environmental justice group and the project is owned 50-50, right between the sort of community uh, leaders and this community group and the and the clean energy developers. I think that model of sort of is very complementary, right, and both side both um, sides of this are are needed, right, to move the project forward. I want to follow up on a point Emil brought up, which is, you know, there's a lot of attention being put on climate change and climate justice and indigenous people, local communities. But most of the money is being managed by NGOs and intermedi intermediaries. Um, and I want to follow up on like how, get a little more detailed on how that dynamic is um, maybe the pros and the cons that you've all experienced or see or can speak to of, um, the indigenous people, local communities actually able to implement the projects. Um, so that little more digging into that intermediary role and your take on that. Yeah, so I can share kind of our experience from the philanthropy side of things. A few weeks ago, I released an op-ed with the executive director of the Honold Foundation talking about trust-based philanthropy as a model, um, and I think some of the highlights of that essentially is if you're gonna give us money, can you just trust us that we're gonna do the work and create less red tape to make us do the work? Um, I think it's funny, some of the conversations we've had is like if it's trust-based philanthropy, you should just trust the partners both ways or don't give us money. Uh, so I think it's an interesting, it seems really obvious, but I don't think it always is. Um, I think also to be supportive of our long-term goals. Uh, some of the best funders that we've had have given us multi-year money. We have a phone call at the end of the year and that is it. And like, that is amazing. Um, so I think pushing other, um, at least in the philanthropy world, to, to model after that. And it's like, if you vetted us, great, and let's move forward. Um, the other, I think, new thing that's happening is the... I'll call it wraparound services, sometimes people call that, but technical support that we may need. So one of our funders is giving us a business coach to work with so we can figure out our potential things. How do we scale up in a way that makes sense for us and not just pick a number out of the blue and then say that's our goal. Um, and so I think some of those things, it has been really helpful helping us think about wellness is a new thing. Um, helping us think about how we further support our staff in comms training. So there's all kinds of things that I think are a part of this work that are not focused exactly on the install pieces of things that have been really helpful. Um, and then in terms of the, the money, yeah, it'd be great if money went directly to the organizations on the front line, grassroots, on the ground. That's been a big complaint among a lot of the nonprofit entities we support is, sure, this entity that's huge will get a lot of money 
but they're not actually do the implementers. So they're the idea and money managers, and then tiny bits of money will actually go to the implementers that are doing the work. So hopefully that's changing, um, but that's kind of what I, it makes me think of. Um, I think from the community perspective, it's uh, d a bit difficult to challenge the big or large NGOs or intermediaries um, that are managing much of this money um, just because because they, if, if we challenge them, it might have repercussions for us in terms of the, the money or the projects that they support. So I think it's really important that um, non-indigenous communities also uh, seek to challenge uh, this system or structure uh, in which in which indigenous peoples are not receiving the, the money directly or um, because um, just doing it from the community, um, it's, it's, it's difficult. So I think it's, um, yeah, it's important to have uh, support internationally and, and yeah. Maybe I would just say that I think we have seven years left to kind of address the SDGs. You know, we spend three years in due diligence sometimes with, uh, you know, international national NGOs. So we really need to kind of speed up their process and, you know, decentralize and have deadlines like private sector do. You know, like on a Friday night, you should really deliver the project. Not, oh, we'll look at it in the next investment committee in six months. So by then you've just lost, uh, you know, football, you know, uh, forest the size of Wales. Uh, so they really need to get on their horses and really get on board with us. I'm just going to say mini rant. It's like I'm getting tired of hearing the word framework. <laughs> Let's build a framework. It's like, can we just do the work, please? Yeah, I was just going to say reflecting as an intermediary, um, <laughs> knowing that, <laughs> knowing that uh, you know, intermediaries can be, um, you know, they're, gate, they're kind of gatekeepers. Um, they also, uh, we also add add costs, add fees, right? Every layer of intermediation that you add to the flow of capital um, adds costs. Um, however, um, they, we, I think we, we appear to be a necessary evil <laughs> in that, um, uh, again, to refer back to the example uh, or to the, uh, this opportunity, as Brett referred to, the uh, billions of dollars that could be or should be or will be flowing from uh, federal government and uh, with the intent of reaching uh, disadvantaged communities, it, they don't just magically appear. The, the, the dollars don't just kind of magically flow to the right place and the right project and or in the right way, right? There, um, there needs to be that sort of work and uh, that, that legwork um, and, and create those right uh, pipelines, the right uh, channels to, uh, to communities. So. Yeah. Thanks, Anir. <laughs> Hope you didn't feel picked on there. <laughs> um, I think we have a few more minutes before we transition to some question and answer from the audience, so be thinking about your questions. Uh, I want to ask, um, just kind of thinking about the whole theme of this SOCAP and trust. The word trust has been brought up so many times across this panel, um, and we've touched on how trust can be built, but I would love to, yeah, talk specifically about trust and each of you from the seat, you know, the rep, what you're representing, share, you know, a bit about what would build trust for you. Um, yeah. Well, I think one of the things about designing the way that we we kind of catalyze that capital you know building trust is really about trying to make sure that it's it's appropriate and patient and has all the factors that are needed for us to be able to effectively explore what it can do um you know and then that's the difference between you know mission aligned and what i would perceive as like traditional finance like you know if it's hanging over our head, returns, you know, expected target, all those things, those are, I mean, uh, of course we know that that's, there's an expectation there, 
But if that's where we start the conversation, it really feels unaligned to like what we're trying to do. So really building out like the infrastructure around how capital can work with a company like Navajo Power, like where where we play. Like of course we want to be more fit and ready for commercial capital. At some point we want to stand on our own legs, but to get there we kind of need that you know um, more under you know more I guess I call it empathetic. <laughs> Um, you know, scenarios so that one, we can build a confidence in the organization, but also to our constituents, to the people that we are accountable to, which is the communities we develop these projects, that they can feel like there's, there's value added in the money we're using. One of the things that I really am trying to figure out is if we build these big infrastructure projects and we finance them the same way they've always been financed, are we just setting the table for extractive capital? You know, that doesn't feel good to me. So as we're building this, we're also hoping to think more broadly about what's the next stage. Once we get through this gauntlet of learning how to use the early stage, the initial investment, how do we grow the relationship to do the next thing that we need to do? which is create equity and ownership that's inclusive of our communities. Because that's going to help us sell our mission better. And it's also going to make us or help us sleep better too when we think about, you know, the support system that we're building in bridging these networks. I think that's a big factor in like saying like, we don't just want, you know, a, a shove off the ledge and to, to learn to fly. We want some guidance on you know, how the institutions with the weight and the, the power that these, these um, you know, institutionalized foundations and things can do to set the table for how we interface with commercial capital. We're trying to set a high bar for development, and I hope that these foundations and groups like Candide set a high bar for how capital can play a role in projects like ours and much of the team's designing because that's ultimately the end is we're trying to rethink how finance works, you know, and to get out of that framework, <laughs> that that is what we've always been told is a limiting factor because if we keep down the same ruts that have failed all our predecessors in trying to address these challenges, we're doomed to make the same, you know, mistakes and to have the same roadblocks that they did. So we kind of have to explore a new way of doing this going forward. And, and I want to hear um, on this question, um, but if we can keep it fairly brief, the remaining comments on this question, um, just to give space for the audience. Okay. I mean, for me, you know, if there's a problem in the world, you give it to an entrepreneur, they will resolve it, right? Look at the driverless car out there. So they need to trust the entrepreneurs doing the business and there will be failures accountability sometimes it's mixed up with accountability I think I think we should have accountability I mean I am accountable to you know but there should be an element of trust as to what why are we trying to do here what's the big picture and real impact investors should really start thinking like this and that's kind of my two cents I think probably an initial conversation just being very clear about what you want from me, why that benefits you, how it benefits me, what's the timeline, and how much work am I expected to put in for how much money. Um, I think all of those things really help frame whether I want to move forward in a conversation. Um, and that's different from what maybe my community, to, for me to build trust, I might have to sit in a four to eight hour meeting before I have a conversation with them. So it ranges across the board. Um, I think in my experience in the Amazon, since we have so many problems or had have a lot of bad experiences with extractive companies, there is an element of mistrust against uh, organizations that come there. Um, in my community, we didn't allow people to enter the community without uh, official permission uh, for many years after the company has had left because the company sent uh, spies and people to study our behavior so that they could, um, so that they could proceed with their project. So I think that transparency is key. and. And also uh, showing that you support the self-determined uh, priorities of that specific community, which is different for, for each community. Thanks. 
All right. Well, I, in our in our final few minutes here, um, yeah, we have about 15 minutes before we're going to be wrapping up. So I'd love if you have a question, please raise your hand, um, and a mic will be brought to you, and or a card for you to fill out. Can I ask a question while we're waiting? Absolutely. Uh, I guess mostly for Emil's work, but how many people invest internationally or have international investment right now? Just kind of curious to break out. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, good morning, guys. Um, Suzanne, I think you're right on point. Uh, my name is Melody Serna. I actually do a lot of business and tribal consulting. I do a lot of that grassroots. Um, get funders to our entrepreneurs and business and kind of navigate those relationships. Um, I just wanted to add a little bit about some intermediary kind of conversation. While they work well in some spaces for some nonprofits, I think when we're looking at the larger impact investments, um, we have to look at the harm that they cause as well. Um, it takes the responsibility off the non-Indigenous funder. Um, you're asking Native intermediaries to then you know, if we're giving $10 million to an intermediary, they're taking 30% off the top for overhead and administrative costs. Now you've got $7 million. Now you want them to do maybe a one-year grant or multi-year grant. They got to get those to their organization. And what you've created in Indian country, which is um, that imperialistic uh, framework that we're talking about, is a crab-in-a-bucket mentality. Um, you're asking Native people to judge other Native people on their projects to fund them versus taking the responsibility to build the relationships with those communities and directly fund those communities and their, and their projects. You know, everything from, you know, Jeff said it earlier, it was really great and it kind of stuck with me for a minute. You know, we talk about climate justice. Climate justice is Native justice. It's Indigenous justice. It has been since time immemorial. You know, climate tech is Native tech. And so when we're not investing in Indigenous places, we have the highest rate of return um, as indigenous businesses. Um, it may take us a little bit longer, but your rate of return and your ROI is huge when you invest in those relationships and native businesses. So instead of saying, I don't know where to start, I don't know how to do it, all you have to do is actually, if you're in your community, pick up a phone, Google. We're everywhere. We're online now. We're, you, can't, you can no longer plead ignorance as funders that come to these conferences year in, year out. This is my second year at SOCAP, and guess what? The philanthropic numbers and the impact investment numbers have not changed. They're not changing because if CEOs don't have a mindset that they want to invest in indigenous businesses because they feel we're high-risk communities, they're not going to invest their money. So I'm here to tell you that investing in us is literally huge for your money, and it's lucrative, and we are worth it. So think about that when you're looking at giving indigenous people globally, not just here in the United States, um, money and stop putting that responsibility onto someone else and take that for yourself as an organization and funder. Thanks for sharing. You just made me think of a few other things in the trust world is like, if you know where Navajo is, you've passed the first step that literally has happened. Someone had no idea where our work was taking place. Um, the second one, I think in terms of longevity, climate change also is what happens when a project is done what does the decommission process look like has the have the developers thought of that and i think um, historically a lot of negative consequences in our environment is because those questions have not been answered or there's no money set aside for that any other hands raised with questions up here at the front Uh, Wado, thank you for, for all of you being here today. Um, so I'm curious what role tribal governments may play in this. Um, you know, I'm just thinking like I work in media and a lot of our native media here in the so-called U.S. is owned or funded or operated in some way by our tribal governments. So I'm just kind of curious like where, where do they play a role in all of this or, or do they? In my experience, it's the reason we exist. Like, you know, to create an alternative to where those governments, I mean, 
a lot of the federal, if you look at a lot of the federal funding that's put out there, the support systems, it, it only supports federal government. So our tribal governments. And as entrepreneurs, we don't have access to that funding directly. So there's kind of like a bit of a, you know, a challenge in working with those institutions because those governments also have enterprises that replicate what we do. And at times they're protective of that. So we, um, you know, Navajo Power, what's interesting is we do work with a lot of governments. You know, we do work with a lot of tribal communities and their associated government entities. But each one has a different level of sophistication. And so some are very savvy and they know how to work a system. Some are so limited and strapped. They're one person offices. They cannot handle the priorities that we kind of bring to the table, let alone manage a grant application, manage, you know, grant administration or foundational. I mean, there, there, there's limiting factors due to these, those things were not created, you know, with the idea of being effective. They were created as a necessity to do transactions for communities. And so in our, in our community, like our, the Navajo Nation, it, it looks very robust and it has a lot of sophistication to it, but it's really resource strapped and it's limited in its understanding of how it even functions because it's less than 50 years old. So it doesn't have that institutional knowledge or experience to be able to enact all of its provisions. We're trying to help inform those governments on how to be better. And from the private sector, we do play a role in trying to partner in these public-private partnerships to be able to catalyze more opportunities through that. But it is kind of difficult with all the bureaucratic um, you know, limitations that governments can have. Yeah, um, I think I would say it's, it's a home run if you have the tribal leadership, the local leadership, the community members all supporting your project. Like, that's the holy grail, I would say. Um, I think groups like Change Labs, if I'm not mistaken, sorry if I'm saying this wrong, but I think they're working with the tribal government to help build a fund to do work. Um, so I think th those are places where there's a now more collaboration between entrepreneurship and tribal entities trying to access money. Um, we, from time to time, have partnered with tribal local tribal leaders to do work. I will say there are times where like we have to move fast, and sometimes that's really challenging to get all of the your ducks in a row to be able to take advantage of that. Um, and I do think. One of the unfortunate things I'm seeing, and I'm hoping this is not true across the board, but I feel like the tribal nations who have the money are getting the resources. Those that have are getting more. Those that do not are struggling. And I feel like sometimes when we tell people like, oh yeah, we should go after the lowest hanging fruit, which is tribes that already have money. And it's like, no, <laughs> you need <laughs> some of the tribes that need the support are the other on the other end of the spectrum. And so some people just want to move fast, so they pick the tribes that have resources already. And I, I don't love that about sometimes moving quickly. But it's super hard to do work sometimes in tribal nations. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think time for one more question. And then I would like each panelist to have a moment to give a closing thought and statement for us all to leave with. Thank you so much for being here today and for your words and everything you've expressed. Um, and what you've shared, I've heard a lot about some of the barriers. And even though our communities may be different, I've often felt somatically it's like we're dealing with a global system and historical inequities of extraction, exploitation, so I'm, like I resonate. Um, and I've heard also pockets of success stories and what works. We have so little time. And for all of us who are operating this space, if you could give like a summary of here are the like critical few, not even success factors, but there's something around positive events. Here are the few that are really cutting a path positively in the midst of this, you know, bureaucratic historical stuff that's not working. Here are the few standouts from where I stand that are working. Because um, it might help a few of us to like, okay, I'm going to go here. That might be a portal. That might be a pathway. Is my question making sense? 
I think so. Uh, I believe the question is, can each panelist speak to um, some standout, some success story, but standout project or entity? Project or entity or constellation of factors, like if you really, like if for my organization and any organizations that are like mine, here are the three or four things or three or four entities that I would say you really need to pay attention to to be successful in this space. Yeah, those kind of leading, you know, exam exemplary models to look to. Sure, I think so. And it could be models or it could be funders or it could be collaboratives or whatever. So I'm a big fan, uh, as an alumni of Change Labs, uh, is a program that's based in Arizona, but I think they're working more globally. Um, I love Native Women Lead. They're doing things, and I think I see some of their people here. Um, and there's a lot of, um, I think within that network, there's, uh, oh my gosh, I'm gonna, sorry, Rebart. I wanna say credit unions, local indigenous leaders in banking and financial world who are coming together to think of really amazing things. And I think I've heard also like OISTA has been great about education um, and us, obviously. <laughs> I, I would say factor, like just thinking about what factors make, like they've been successful for us, like having champions within these lending and foundation institutions, like, you know, like Candide has a wealth of really compassionate folks that, that are able to kind of help us, like, guide what, what it is we need to do to configure ourselves. You know, there, there's an understanding there that's led to a lot of what I would call place setting. You know, um, institutions that take that risk um, carry a lot of weight to bring in others. So when they open that door, when, when we have friendly people in these places, and there are a lot of champions I could, could think about in, in, our, you know, in our ecosystem who are friendly to the cause. That's the first thing we need is someone warm and inviting to be able to just be able to understand where we're coming from so that we can build up our capacity to meet what it is they need in order to feel comfortable in investing. The other part is, you know, for us being able to, um, you know, kind of reverse engineer the outcome and working like I would call like whiteboarding through our scenario allows us to really think through all the different mechanisms that this world needs to function. Those two things have really been game changing for us because prior to that, we wouldn't know, we wouldn't know where to start or how to configure ourselves to be investable. That information, I, I don't know if it's really available out there, but it's extremely valuable for organizations who are trying to solve ground level problems and design themselves to be attractive for investment. That, that's a big piece. I can be really short, yeah. I um, brief. The, um, uh, I think one organization that uh, really deserves a shout out um, in terms of success stories is N NDN Fund, uh, which also happens to be in the Olamina uh, portfolio. And uh, NDN Fund was created to support, to provide capital to climate projects in Native communities. And again, in the, uh, uh, in the um, um, spirit of the value of intermediaries, right, the work that they're doing, the, re the, the projects that they're supporting, the relationships, the knowledge, is not something that you know we could you know we could have done right or anybody else could have done and there are unique it's a unique strategy in that most CDFIs in this working in these communities are typically quite limited in the in the capital they can provide right they can often provide really like small con consumer loans or small business loans that are important but are not able to provide this sort of next level funding for for these climate projects so is that part of Indian Collective? Is that one of their projects? Um, I don't have an answer to the question. Um, I'm still looking for the answer. But in the Shared Prosperity project that I'm working on, um, we are speaking to indigenous peoples um, across the world, um, such as Navajo Power as well. 
and we are trying to learn um, based on the local experience um, what are some best practices that companies, indigenous communities, uh, banks, investors, and governments can um, can implement or can do. Um, but we, we don't have the answer yet. And one thing that we're seeing is that there are um, indigenous community owned or led renewable energy projects in some countries such as in the US, Canada, uh, New Zealand. Um, so we're trying to see what, what are the learnings that we can um, take and, and uh, implement in other countries um, to ensure that, that we learn uh, from the challenges and risks and opportunities. Um, so if any of you have any insights on this, um, yeah, I would love to speak to you. I'd love to hear from Panjani before we close um, in our final minute here. Um, and then, but all these panelists, I believe, will be around here or step outside and you can um, come with some questions. So a closing thought, maybe. Um, for me, you know, I would say us. <laughs> uh, but um, I think there's different organization looking at blended finance. So, and I, and I think blended finance is very, very important that we bring, it brings together different types of investors, you know, government quangos, private investors, philanthropic investors. And I think to, together, if these, we can make, make these models work, we can deploy a lot of capital and it will attract more entrepreneurs to the field and it will develop the ecosystem. And I think I, I highly recommend that you know, we push that more going forward.